which we saw January 16th, the air assault on Iraq that opened the Gulf War. For the first time in nearly 20 years, America was involved in a full-scale battle. This was not a movie. The drama of real-life fighting is taking place in Iraq and Kuwait, what is now referred to as the theater of war. Nightly we have watched as the curtain has risen and fallen on that theater. Tonight, we'll take a look backstage. I'm Bill Carey in Saudi Arabia, and this is a special edition of 24 Hours. on New Center 5 special report has been underwritten by the Sam Dell Group. The way we do business means a great deal to you. By the Young Agency, offering total asset protection and insurance services. By Chapels, serving you with 10 stores in central New York. And by Marine Midland Bank. Let's work it out together. January 16, 1991, a date in time that we'll never forget. Those things we tend to take for granted take on more significance when the lives of brave men and women of our armed forces are on the line. Literally thousands of Central New Yorkers have been touched in some way by this crisis, and each day we're reminded of the patriotic strength and resolve of those who have been directly affected. They're our customers, our employees, our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones. The Samdell Automotive Group salutes you. Throughout Chapels, associates have been personally affected by the events in the Middle East. Judy Hamill, in a Shop City store, initiated the wearing of yellow ribbons. Charlotte Hazelton, a Messina, brought ribbons from home. Other associates initiated support groups for military families. For Lori Gleason's birthday, the accounting department decorated her work area with yellow ribbons for her husband's safe return. Throughout the company, there is an overwhelming support for the safe return of friends and family members. Chapels pollutes them all. Good evening, everybody. Before tonight's special edition of 24 Hours, an update on the latest situation in the Gulf War. President Bush goes on the air an hour from now to address the nation. CBS News says that the president will say the U.S. military campaign is over. But he will not report a ceasefire. Apparently, President Bush will end coalition offensive actions, but will say defensive action will still be taken. Meanwhile, Kuwait City has been liberated, of course, by Allied forces, and correspondent Jay Levine is there. The first Marines entered Kuwait City after three days of slicing through lines of enemy defenders. The welcome they got here was truly remarkable. The best part that I liked was when they was congratulating us on this good job seeing us here, and you know it was nice seeing some friendly people instead of the enemy. The troops have done an outstanding job. Resistance been little, had some fighting, but uh, taking no casualties. They had taken the city without a struggle. And in fact, the show of military force here today was already celebrating a victory. We've had uh, a tremendous, tremendous success. Uh, and I couldn't be happier uh, or more proud of the Marines and the soldiers uh, that fought with us. It was revealed today that the plan for the assault on Kuwait City was accelerated in its final hours after reports of Iraqi atrocities against Kuwaiti civilians. 
Iraq is also allegedly accused of taking tens of thousands of young Kuwaiti men hostage when they left the city. We were told a hundred different reasons why they were taken. Number one, to be a bargaining chip if the time came when bargaining chips were needed. Another one was for retribution because, of course, at that time Iraq was saying that these people were not Kuwaitis, these were citizens of Iraq and therefore they could do anything they wanted to with them. He'll find no dissent from Kuwaiti. But today wasn't really the time to relive the oftentimes horrible recent past. It was time to rejoice and give thanks. One area left virtually untouched by the Iraqis was the U.S. Embassy. Marine guards tell me tonight they doubt the Iraqis were even inside. The only sign of the occupation, graffiti and posters on the exterior walls. And the grateful Kuwaitis are already removing that. Jay Levine for CBS News in Kuwait City. Once again, President Bush will address the nation an hour from now, saying, according to CBS News, that for all intents and purposes, the hostilities in the uh, Kuwait theater of operation are over. The U.S. will reportedly spell out conditions for an Iraqi surrender. I'm Ron Curtis. Stay with News Center 5 and CBS News for the latest on the Gulf. Time now for a special edition of 24 Hours in the Gulf. Just after midnight at an air base in central Saudi Arabia, Ahead is a busy day of bombing for a fighter squadron from Syracuse. The pilots are sleeping, but this base is far from quiet. Without us, the Air Force is just another bankrupt airline. <laughs> I love it. Tracy Kent, Wayne Walker, and Wesley Clark are busy arming these birds of prey with a deadly cargo. Bombs, every conceivable type. 500 pounds, 2,000 pounds, cluster bombs. A lot of work does get done. We put in a lot of hours. You know, I want to I want to get there, I want to do my job, and I want to get home. I want to get home in one piece. And uh, as far as, you know, my, my particular position, we're, we're loading bombs, and, uh, you know, to me, it's just something that, that's it's got to be done, and it's got to be done properly, you know, safely. And, uh, and I don't carry any baggage with me about it. I, I feel that, uh, you know, we're doing our part, and that's, that's the important thing, you know, it's a team. It's a study in contrast, tough, back-breaking work, and the highest of high-tech. Weapons of war that could produce peace. For these men, on a dark and chilly night in the Arabian desert, there's only one goal, getting home. The hardest part of being here is, is being away from my wife and son. And uh, I've got three kids at home. Uh, the one-year-old, she'll be walking by the time I get back. I miss that, you know. That's absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, the hardest part of being here. Uh, you just miss them awful bad. I'm sure it's harder on them than it is on us here, too, because we know we're safe. Uh, the rear canopy was just uh, crazed. It got like a fog in it that you, so the pilot couldn't see back, so we had to replace it. In a hangar just off the flight line, Sergeant Phil Sales and his crew are busy getting an F-16 jet ready to fly. The heroes fly them during the day and break them, but uh, the night shift fixes them so we can fly again tomorrow. <laughs> The night crew receives few of the accolades accorded this highly successful air campaign. But without their work, that air campaign could not have succeeded. I preflate the airplane. I look it over, uh, make sure all the liquids in it are there, everything that's visible. Uh, I try to make sure that everything I can see is good and the way it's supposed to be. Without my signature in a book, the pilot's not going to take the airplane to go fly. Um, with my signature in a book, I'm telling the pilot that the airplane is flyable. The thousands of sorties have required these aircraft to fly more often than anyone had expected. Keeping them airborne with a minimum of mechanical breakdowns has surprised most of the analysts. And most of that success stems from long hours, overnight, maintaining these planes. Not all of us really like it, but we're here to do a job. And if working 12 hours a day, we can get the job done and then go home, then it's worth it. With the light of dawn, this jet will return to the flight line. 
Phil Sales and his men have done their work. When a pilot guides this craft into the skies over a rock in Kuwait, they'll share in the glory. It's their work which made the mission possible. That's why my name is on the airplane.
you can see there, in the event that uh, there should be a problem inside a the cockpit, there might be a bird strike or something, everything will come and his base is pretty well protected all the way around. And then he just got his communication cord and his oxygen hose and he just connects him to the cockpit right with that there. He's all set to go. Arriving at his office, the pilot is ready to go to work. But there are still some preliminaries. This is the walk around, a final series of checks by pilot and ground crew to make sure the F-16 is prepared for its mission. checklist, a last review of engine and safety features to make sure that mechanical problems don't arise before takeoff. Switch is coming off. Nozzle's closed. Switch to button. Throttle to button. It's coming back off, Christopher. Thanks, Nick. Nozzle's open. Okay. With the checklist complete and briefing materials given a final review, there's just one more stop before this jet is on its way to war. January 16, 1991, a date in time that we'll never forget. Those things we tend to take for granted take on more significance when the lives of brave men and women of our armed forces are on the line. Literally thousands of Central New Yorkers have been touched in some way by this crisis, and each day we're reminded of the patriotic strength and resolve of those who have been directly affected. They're our customers, our employees, our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones. The Samdell Automotive Group salutes you. Uh, 
the way my mother would take it. You know, we all know our job's pretty good, and I'm really confident in what these Jets can do. But, you know, it's how my family at home takes it. Back home, Peggy Lathrop gets her first good look at her sons and husband since they left. Are you proud of them? Very proud of them. We're all proud of them. Yeah. I love them. We love them. <laughs> and miss them. Peggy and her daughter, Valerie, David's girlfriend, Lorraine, and Tom's wife, Sam, the Lathrop women, all watched our tape of the Lathrop men. I want to climb inside that TV and reach <laughs> on and grab them, but yeah, I just can't. I feel a lot better after seeing them. I think they look wonderful. Oh, boy. I was worried about my father, but he looks pretty good. They feel good, the Lathrop men say, and are glad to be with each other. No, I'm happy to have him here with me. Keeps me out of trouble. Yeah, they, they bother you. When the plane right over, when all three of you on one plane, it bothers us more than it bothers them. Mm -hmm. I'm anxious to go home, but I'll be, I'm here to do a job. It's what I trained for for 30 years. I think he was excited to go. I can see that in this tape that he was, that he's excited to be there. He's finally putting to use everything he trained for and everything that all these years that he hasn't ever had to be put it on the line. Now he's put it on the line and he's doing a good job. And I think he's pleased with himself. You know, a sense of fulfillment. All these years I've trained for this, now I'm doing it and I'm doing a good job. What did he say in the letter to you that he said he was something about he was glad to be here and that he hoped you could understand that? Yeah, what he was said... That? The night the war started, he wrote me a letter. It was some letter. I think some of these letters should be published about the fear that they're going through. But the bottom line was that they were very happy that they were there to help and proud, proud to be there. That's how he feels, and I know that's how the boys feel. She's back with my sister and uh, my wife, but you know, not having uh, any of us there, it's, it's got to be tough on And so, even though we miss them, at least we have each other. And and they know that. They know that yeah. we're all together and that we're keeping busy so that we aren't getting really depressed even though we can't wait till they come back. <laughs> well, I'm a crew chief on a weapons load crew. And there's a three-man crew. We come out here before the planes are launched and arm all the munitions that are on the aircraft. As a crew chief, I stand out front and make sure that all the safety pins and arming devices are pulled. And uh, the other two members of my crew, one on each wing, pull all the safety devices that need to be pulled, arm the gun, missiles, bombs. This is the last stop before Baghdad, the place where an F-16 becomes a lethal weapon. This is where the pins are pulled, the bombs are armed as pilots prepare to make their way north. It's a lonely spot on this airfield, but even here, personnel share in the pride of what's been accomplished. I think it's been moving along pretty smooth. You know, of course, we haven't heard too much as what's going on actually going up north. And, uh, you know, that's all the main concern with us here. Uh, hopefully, we're doing the best job we can. Probably the only real big surprise is the sheer size of it. You know, when you stop and think that uh, this is only one activity in, in, the, in the entire theater, and there's so many more units or uh, air places, air patches just like this all over the theater that uh, the magnitude of this thing is, is staggering sometimes when you stop and think about all the people and equipment that's here. I'm here for a reason, and I don't mind being here for that one reason. I take pride in my job, yeah. I think we're doing a good job. It sounds like they're pounding the living hell out of them. And this is why this base exists. To deliver an explosive punch clearing the way for a ground invasion, using weapons of war to build a peace. At times, it appeared to be Iraq's only effective weapon. At times, deadly. It cost 28 lives this week. Most of the time, its impact was minimal. The Scuds, They've rained down on parts of Israel and Saudi Arabia. 
While February 21st appeared to be a routine day on this central Saudi Arabian airbase, there would be a break in the routine. The Scuds were flying again. Personnel rush to a bunker and scramble to don protective gear. The Scuds have yet to carry chemical warheads, but precautions must be taken. This has been the first time in uh, almost three weeks since we've done this. The first two weeks it was every day, every night. The jets, prepared for bombing missions, have been scrambled to avoid being stuck on the ground. For those not flying jets, the Scud Alert has meant little more than a 10-minute work break. I'm listening to see where they come over for a clear. Who will, who will give you that? It'll actually be Central Command down here. Maintenance control. As has been the case since the start of the war, no warheads hit this base and the all clear is soon sounded. For the people at this base, the Scud remains little more than an annoyance. Well, kind of woke me up here in the middle of a deep sleep, but uh, we got through it. I don't think he's got anything to throw at us. You know, we've now that we've been here for a while, we kind of know what, what his missiles can carry and how far they can carry and what they can carry. And um, unless it hits you on the head, you know, you'll be dead. But uh, um, we're not that concerned about it now. And that's great when he does launch one because the F-15s are right up there and they know right where it came from. And that's the end of that Scud site. So. that to the Western eye seems antiquated, an anachronism in the 20th century. But to the Arab eye, this is how life should be. The West, they feel, has allowed modern thoughts, ideas, and ways of life to rob it of its moral code. There are modern things here, modern places, but there are strict controls in place to hold on to the Arab way, the ways of Islam. <laughs> In this land, it is not the camel that looks out of place near a modern city. It is this place, an island in an Arab sea. From all appearances, an American neighborhood carved out of the desert. This is the Aramco compound, a place where thousands of Westerners employed by the oil industry live and work. Continue not to fly uh, up against any of our coalition forces. Brad Depoy is from Ithaca. He first moved to this place in 1979. Well, the, a pretty base cause. You know, I looked up, uh, in the newspaper for an ad, and there was a salary double what I was making, and I thought I'd investigate it, and this is what it turned out to be. The first time around, yeah, Brad, his wife Donna, and their children stayed in Saudi Arabia for nearly seven years. And then they came home to the U.S., living for a time in Casanova. What they found was that their concept of home had changed. And within two years, they were back in Dahran. I mean, it was an adventure for us back in 79. The kids were little, and we just, we were ready to go with something different. And it was different, but we had more trouble going back to the States when we went back with culture shock than we did coming here. We go back to the States and it's just rush, 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 rush. And you come back here, everybody who goes out says, I am so ready to get back home. I mean, we consider this home because we've been here for so long now. 
that you just you want to get home you want to get out of your suitcase and you just want to relax for the westerner working in saudi arabia comes the realization that while the arab needs western help the arab does not want to rely on that help it varies dramatically with the educational level of the saudi and how many generations are removed from you know if their grandfather was also well educated uh, I find that seems to be the major factor in, in their attitude. Uh, you find the person who has not been away from the desert very long still still maintains a lot of Bedouin standards. Uh, then yes, they have a different perception of the American. He, uh, like like because her eyes are uncovered and he look and she looks at her in the eye is very suggestive to this man, whereas the educated man accepts her as a Westerner. You know that that kind of thing. And there's concern in Saudi Arabia now, concerns about the West and its role in that nation's future. I think probably it's a vast percentage of, of the population feel uh, that their position in the world as the protector of Islam is at risk as a result of having the Westerners here. I think there's a very strong feeling like that. And, and there are, of course, different political, you know, which I really don't want to get into now, you know, climates within the country that, that uh, uh, depending on their background, religious sect and background within the country. They have different opinions and different outlooks towards that. Within my personal experience, the more majority of them, uh, other than one or two, are very glad they're here. They feel, they very, feel very uh, earnestly that if they weren't here, that Saddam Hussein would be here instead by now. For the Americans in the kingdom, these have been difficult weeks. Rising concerns over the future of this region, combined with more day-to-day -day concerns about safety. brought in water and we brought in the television so we can see what's happening and we've got some food in there and we have sleeping bags and the air mattresses and a couple of nights we slept in there when we had them two or three times during the night we just stayed right there the whole time we get up and we go oh another one <laughs> i mean the first few were i can remember the very first one it was oh my god what's that i mean you know you had no idea you're sound asleep and this happens I mean, you have no forewarning whatsoever. So it was a situation where you quickly got up and came downstairs and got into your sealed room that they told us we should set up and sat there until the all clear sound came on. And then you go back to bed and go through it all over again. It was unnerving for the first few nights, but I, we haven't had one for quite a while now. Americans living in Saudi Arabia have shared dangers with their Arab hosts. They have worked together. They've also shared some common goals in this war. The concern of the Americans here is that Americans back home not misjudge the people of an entire region based on the actions of a troubled few. And the American has a tendency to think either a terrorist or somebody who's going to go and buy up your whole community with all his money when he comes in with his oil money. And they're not like it. They're peaceful people, very peaceful people. It takes a lot to get an Arab angry. He's 
stays out of trouble. And thank heaven he stays away from drugs. He's a good boy. of Air Force personnel since December. Little more than an airstrip had been here before that date. Now it's home to a sprawling base. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Kerpel is with the Syracuse Air National Guard. He's deputy commander of this base. It's gone, it's gone very well. We've got uh, an awful lot of people here, 30% of whom are Air National Guard of several different units besides Syracuse. It's, it's gone well because we've got a job to do. There's one big mission and everybody has to support it. And while these unit members support a mission, it's the job of the Air Force to support the members. They've gone to great lengths to keep morale high. This huge tent city is home to the airmen and women. And when the going gets tough, there are movies to go to. Or you can work to get tough. A base library can offer the latest news from home or a diversion. Besides books and newspapers, there are videotapes to view. And for those interested, there's even a chance to make a video to send home. There are other keys to morale which have gotten close attention here. One is contact with home. Oh yeah, hanging in there. Oh yeah, I'm great. Yeah. No, no, we're doing we're hanging in there. Yeah, it's exciting. Two tents have been erected, filled with phones. AT and T is in now. Right. Uh, but uh, when we were first here, the first call, they, they've only been in for a week or so. Yeah, it was a big boost. Real big boost. It really they can reach home when they have to. I wouldn't want some of the phone bills, but uh, about $20, $25 for 15 minutes. But it beats not being able to communicate, and that's helped, okay. that's, that's helped immensely. the other great front line in the battle to keep morale high, the food line. Three months ago, Robert Smorrell of the Syracuse Air National Guard Unit arrived to set up this operation. Basically, we run 24 hours a day serving four meals, uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and midnight meal. And uh, we just continually work 12-hour shifts every day, and we finish one meal and start preparing the next meal. The kitchens actually here is two kitchens, each of them uh, capable of feeding 1,100, so it's 2,200 people a side, or a total of 4,400 people. And we're pretty much up to capacity. There have always been complaints about food in the service. There are complaints here. But overall, Smorrell says, there's little to complain about. People are really amazed at what they're getting here. You know, normally they thought they're going to a desert, you know, conditions and all that. It would be a little more austere. But we've been doing pretty good. We've been fortunate with supplies and everything else. All in all, the men and women on this base say the efforts to keep morale high have worked. Not bad. I, uh, I expected a whole lot worse. Um, and they've really done a great job as far as uh, for what we've had to work with here. They've done a good job putting things together for us. The personnel are huddled ten to a tent in this massive housing complex. I just hate it when unexpected guests drop in. <laughs> it is not the best for privacy, but the people of this unit are making the best of it. Sort of like being up in Old Forge, New York in the middle of the winter. It's just the only difference is we got sand here instead of snow. But it, the, the conditions are about the same. We have to do it for ourselves, and pretty much. Morale's pretty good. Morale's very good, I think, for the for the uh, for being in the center of the desert in a country we know nothing about. And when things get too crowded, or the menu at the mess hall isn't to someone's liking, there are any number of activities to keep people busy, from basketball to baseball, even golf. A nine-hole course carved from sand. There's even a way around what has to be the world's biggest sand trap. Well, no, what we 
we do is carry the fairway with us. They're little <laughs> mats, green mats of uh, indoor-outdoor carpet. You hit the ball and you carry your fairway and lay it down. <laughs> so it's been going quite well. Right? They are the stars of the show, the front men for the thousands of support personnel on this base. They are the pilots of Desert Storm. It used to be that you could go up there and uh, find big encampments. Now they're all spread out and it seems like there's, there's fewer of them. We've grown used to their reports of success. It's that success which paved the way for Desert Storm's move into Kuwait and Iraq. Good, good day. Got some tanks, yeah. Do what? Yeah, I've got some tanks today, I think. Like in their laps or? Uh... Oh, right in their laps, yeah. Trucks, tanks, got them all. Good day, nice weather. There may have been some question as to whether National Guard pilots would measure up to regular Air Force personnel. It's a question that was quickly put to rest. Oh, I think the standard that we we came in here was, was very high. Now I think they understand just how high our standards are. The quality of the pilots, the 174th, is excellent. Uh, I had no problems at all coming over here with all the pilots we've got, and I think they've stood up to this challenge extremely well. And uh, the wing commander's already commented on it. Very professional. Their schedule has been a grueling one, demanding flight after flight for more than a month. And the hours are long, you know, but uh, we've, we split it up where uh, half the squadron will fly the early go for about a week, and then uh, the other half comes in 10 o'clock or so, and then next week we'll swap off so that everybody gets a chance at uh, getting a little bit of sleep. As far as rest goes, we get plenty of rest, and uh, uh, so they're, you know, they're, we're, we're generally pretty rested. As far as getting tired, I think, you know, that there's a certain amount of that, but uh, there's never any routine involved, and and uh, you know, so pretty much we're, uh, we're rested and feel ready every day. In civilian life, it's Captain Steve Abshear of Continental Airlines. Since early January, it's been Lieutenant Colonel Steve Abshear of the U.S. Air Force. Well, we've been pretty busy. Right from the beginning, uh, we were flying, uh, you know, since the beginning of the, of the war. I would say I've flown, I've kind of lost count, to tell you the truth. Uh, we've had good targets, uh, especially in the past week or so. Gordon Spooner is another Continental pilot serving in Saudi Arabia with the New York Air National Guard. Captain Spooner says he and the other pilots have gotten used to their desert duty but he fights the urge to say it's become routine. You don't want to say routine, but certainly the first, uh, you know, the first week was more hectic than what it is right now. You can't let it become uh, routine or complacent. You can't become complacent if that's when you're going to get in trouble. Uh, no, I don't want to say it has become routine. You know, every time you go up there, something different's going to happen to you. It's fairly exciting. So, no, not routine at all. <laughs> Two months ago, Dave Sermonero of Clay was packing his bags, preparing for time away from his family to be with his other family, the members of the 174th in Saudi Arabia. This is where he spends his days now. His job, computer repair and setup. When we got here, there was a lot of communications that wasn't set up. And Sergeant Julio and myself went out and I worked a lot with him on setting up and programming radios because a lot of the areas out here didn't have the antennas or the equipment. His wife Ursula and his two daughters Renee and Melinda just recently got to see these pictures brought back by New Center 5. We're being well taken care of. We've got uh, most of the comforts of home. <laughs> it was reassuring for the family to see the lifestyle at the base. That's a little better than we figured it would be over here. We have better facilities than I anticipated. Uh, we do have 10 people to a tent. We were told that before. And uh, as far as it goes for the, la the latrine system, we thought it was a little more crude than what it really is. It's really not all that bad. We feel that we're pretty lucky here uh, compared to the frontline soldier who doesn't have half the stuff that we do here. We've heard many stories, um, some good, some bad, but I mean to actually see it is one thing. It's bigger than what I pictured. I thought it was going to be like a little small base and his tent and a couple of other tents. And I thought it was going to be a little like MASH, how 
because we used to watch it and stuff, and when he said it, it looked like it a little bit, we thought it was going to look like that. Another reality, Tent City is a long way from central New York. Missing the least is the snow and the cold. Missing the most is my family and my wife. That's, that's what I miss the most, I, I'll be honest with you there. His family is honest too. Well, I miss like him coming home and then we greet him at the door and we sit down for dinner, but now it's just like we go to dinner. <laughs> and it's kind of weird because he used to lay on this, on the chair and at night and we used to watch his programs instead of the ones that we wanted. <laughs> <sighs> Lonely at times, I'll tell you. Um, we miss him. We miss him a great you know, deal. Just, he's my best friend. So, um, just to tell him the good things that are happening, problems, he's not here anymore. So, um, I get to have to handle a lot of it myself, and I get to call my daughter at college and talk to her almost every night. And, of course, Melinda's here, and David's here at night. It's easier to write on paper how you feel about a person rather than, you know what I mean? I, I like, my father's my father, but when he goes away into, a, like, a threatening situation like that, if he becomes more of like a, a real good friend of yours too. Talk so. to him a little bit more now than yeah. he ever did. Yeah, yeah. Because when, when you grow up, you know, and then you become more, um, how should I say, well, you, you hang around your friends more, you know, and you kind of get away from the daddy kind of thing, but now I kind of say, daddy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> kind of want to draw to him. Says she's doing good in school. Renee tries to write the, uh, every day. My wife got one marked the seventh and then turned around the other day and got one marked the fourteenth. And uh, this is all the way up to about the second of February, so hopefully we'll see some more starting uh, starting tomorrow. I see something a little bit more recent. For Dave, mail is a real morale booster. It gives him news from home, plus it reminds him of the love and support from his family. This makes the day. This is this makes the day, yeah. That's what I look forward to every day is getting my mail. You open them? Uh, yes, I got I open them all. Where are you from? Well, I got uh, a couple of cards from my uh, father-in-law. Uh, I got a nice nice card from a friend of mine in Utica with a scapula. And I got a letter from my daughter, but unfortunately today I didn't get anything from my wife, so hopefully tomorrow we'll get it. Phone calls once in a while, cards and letters. Flowers ordered over the phone for Valentine's Day. Not the way any family or couple would want to live. But the Sermoneros claim some good is coming from this trial of war. Renee feels she's really communicating with her father. Ursula thinks she's become closer with her children. And they all agree they took some of the heartwarming moments of family for granted. And we do pray a lot. That's one thing we do because we figure that's the only thing that's going to, you know, um, keep us together. some of the story of the Gulf War here in Saudi Arabia. During the next few minutes, we thought we'd let you see some of the faces of the people serving here.
Thank you. Hello. Hi, Mandy. Hey, Beth. Hey, Donna. Hey, Donna. Uh, thanks for everything. We're all doing fine. Hi, team. Chapels will make available the Praymate doll in all of our stores. Proceeds from the doll sales and a matching contribution from Chapels will benefit the United Way Military Family Support Program. For the family and friends of our troops in the Gulf, we invite you to visit any Chapel store to record a five-minute audio tape message. The audio message will then be mailed to any service person in the Gulf at no charge. We look forward to the safe and speedy return of our friends and family members. Chapels salutes them all. Come on, little brother, keep up. I found the perfect spot to put my dream house. Uh, the way you work, you'll have to retire to use it. I'm thinking about it. Retirement. Your money should work harder than ever. Marine Midland Professionals and a Marine Gain Savings Plan can help. What do you think? What's the story? Next year, the business is all yours. Marine Gain Savings from Marine Midland. Let's work it out together. January 16, 1991, a date in time that we'll never forget. Those things we tend to take for granted take on more significance when the lives of brave men and women of our armed forces are on the line. Literally thousands of Central New Yorkers have been touched in some way by this crisis, and each day we're reminded of the patriotic strength and resolve of those who have been directly affected. They're our customers, our employees, our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones. The Samdell Automotive Group salutes you. unpredictable as the region where it's been fought. America braced for thousands of casualties and the possibility of a long war. What we found after January 16th was an Iraqi Air Force that did little more than shuttle flights to Iran and after some softening up by our Air Force, the Iraqi ground army was tired of the fight. The Gulf War has opened a new era in the Middle East just what its impact will be in the years to come is anyone's guess. Looking out at the sands of the Saudi Peninsula, one Middle East expert said we should view the grains of sand as tears. Tears shed in war after war in the Middle East. Like the sands, their location shifts depending on the wind, but they never go away. So many grains of sand so many tears. I'm Bill Kelly in Saudi Arabia. This has been a special edition of 24 Hours. You are my, my friend, even though we are war. From a
24 hours, a new Center 5 special report has been underwritten by the Sandell Group. The way we do business means a great deal to you. By the Young Agency, offering total asset protection and insurance services. By Chapels, serving you with 10 stores in Central New York. And by Marine Midland Bank. Let's work it out together. Introducing the Fay Coupon Book. It's like getting over a $250 payoff through the mail. Fay's brand diapers for boys or girls are just $6.77 after instant rebate. Six ounce Lysol spray, assorted fragrances are only $1.57 each. And the Tracer 2 Diabetes Glucose Testing Kit is actually free after $75 rebate. Enter now to win a Florida vacation for two in St. Petersburg Clearwater to be given away free by Fay's Drugs. to duty in Saudi Arabia. New Center 5 was there as well. We spent days with members of the 174th Air National Guard, the boys from Syracuse, at their desert base called Camelot. It's, it's gone well because we got job to do. There's one big mission and everybody has to support it. Special reports on the ways of war firsthand from the men and women serving in Operation Desert Storm this week on New Center 5. Fighting fecal bacteria in the water in DeWitt. The story tonight. You're watching CBS News continuing coverage of the war in the Gulf. From CBS News headquarters in New York, here is Charles Curald. Good evening. This may be the night the war ends. President Bush is about to speak to the nation. We think he is going to announce that Kuwait is liberated and allied military objectives have been achieved. The president will speak to us in about a minute. While we're waiting for him, uh, we're going to go to Dan Rather in liberated Kuwait City. Dan? Good evening, Charles. The sound of distant artillery fire ended about two and a half or three hours ago here. That may prove to be significant. The great oil fires of Kuwait are still burning. 500 oil wells set afire. Huge black drapery of smoke hangs over at least a quarter of the country. This afternoon as we drove in, people were beginning to come out of their houses and say, thank Allah for President Bush, thank Allah for America. Their sense of exhilaration at Kuwait, Kuwait City being free again, indescribable, a sense of deliverance. Charles? Dan Rather in Kuwait City will be returning to you, Dan. Uh, way to the north of where Dan Rather was reporting, uh, in southern Iraq, one of the great tank battles, perhaps the greatest since World War II, is nearly over now, and the vaunted Republican guards, the best soldiers Saddam Hussein has, have uh, been destroyed division by division. That battle is still going on as the president prepares to speak to the nation. The way is liberated. Iraq's army is defeated. Our military objectives are met. Kuwait is once more in the hands of Kuwaitis in control of their own destiny. We share in their joy, a joy tempered only by our compassion for their ordeal. Tonight, the Kuwaiti flag once again flies above the capital of a free and sovereign nation. And the American flag flies above our embassy. Seven months ago, America and the world drew a line in the sand. We declared that the aggression against Kuwait would not stand. And tonight, America and the world have kept their word. This is not a time of euphoria, certainly not a time to gloat, but it is a time of pride. Pride in our troops, pride in the friends who stood with us in the crisis, Pride in our nation and the people whose strength and resolve made victory quick, decisive, and just. And soon, we will open wide our arms to welcome back home to America our magnificent fighting forces. 
No one country can claim this victory as its own. It was not only a victory for Kuwait, but a victory for all the coalition partners. This is a victory for the United Nations, for all mankind, for the rule of law, and for what is right. After consulting with Secretary of Defense Cheney, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Powell, and our coalition partners, I am pleased to announce that at midnight tonight, Eastern Standard Time, exactly 100 hours since ground operations commenced and six weeks since the start of Operation Desert Storm, all United States and coalition forces will suspend offensive combat operations. It is up to Iraq whether this suspension on the part of the coalition becomes a permanent ceasefire. Coalition political and military terms for a formal ceasefire include the following requirements. Iraq must release immediately all coalition prisoners of war, third country nationals, and the remains of all who have fallen. Iraq must release all Kuwaiti detainees. Iraq also must inform Kuwaiti authorities of the location and nature of all land and sea mines. Iraq must comply fully with all relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions. This includes a rescinding of Iraq's August decision to annex Kuwait and acceptable an acceptance in principle of Iraq's responsibility to pay compensation for the loss, damage, and injury its aggression has caused. The coalition calls upon the Iraqi government to designate military commanders to meet within 48 hours with their coalition counterparts at a place in the theater of operations to be specified to arrange for military aspects of the ceasefire. Further, I have asked Secretary of State Baker to request that the United Nations Security Council meet to formulate the necessary arrangements for this war to be ended. This suspension of offensive combat operations is contingent upon Iraq's not firing upon any coalition forces and not launching Scud missiles against any other country. If Iraq violates these terms, coalition forces will be free to resume military operations. At every opportunity, I have said to the people of Iraq that our quarrel was not with them, but instead with their leadership, and above all with Saddam Hussein. This remains the case. You, the people of Iraq, are not our enemy. We do not seek your destruction. We have treated your POWs with kindness. Coalition forces fought this war only as a last resort and look forward to the day when Iraq is led by people prepared to live in peace with their neighbors. We must now begin to look beyond victory and war. We must meet the challenge of securing the peace. In the future, as before, we will consult with our coalition partners. We've already done a good deal of thinking and planning for the post-war period, and Secretary Baker has already begun to consult with our coalition partners on the region's challenges. There can be and will be no solely American answer to all these challenges, but we can assist and support the countries of the region and be a catalyst for peace. In this spirit, as Secretary Baker will go to the region next week, to begin a new round of consultations. This war is now behind us. Ahead of us is the difficult task of securing a potentially historic peace. Tonight, though, let us be proud of what we have accomplished. Let us give thanks to those who risked their lives. Let us never forget those who gave their lives. May God bless our valiant military forces and their families, and let us all remember them in our prayers. Good night, and may God bless the United States of America.
President Bush speaking to the nation from the Oval Office. He said the war is over, assuming the Iraqi forces uh, stop shooting at the Allied uh, troops and stop shooting scuds at Israel or uh, Saudi Arabia. At midnight tonight, the president said, Allied forces will suspend all offensive combat operations. Let's go straight to Dan Rather for his uh, reactions. He's in newly liberated Kuwait City. Dan? Thanks, Charles. Well, first reaction is, thank God. Thank God it's over. And it's very clear from the conversations we've had today with the young U.S. Marines who fought their way up this coast road right along the Persian Gulf, and it was a tough fight right into Kuwait City to liberate this along with the pan-Arab forces. They're going to see this as the G day. They were already saying this afternoon, the B for victory sign, calling it BJ, BG day is near. Well, President Bush made it clear tonight that DG day is here. Now, there's work to be done, as the Marine commanders made clear tonight, that part of their job, now that the Iraqis are out of here, and they fled, not in any orderly fashion, they fled leaving their dead, wounded, and equipment behind and got out of here, the Marines and other forces are now going to start blowing up their equipment. There's a lot of tanks, a lot of artillery, a lot of armored pieces around here, and they're methodically going to go through and blow up all of that equipment. I have no doubt that that will also be the case in southern Iraq. Mostly what your average young American fighting man or woman wants to do here is get out of here. That's been the case ever since they got here. Their attitude right the way through has been, let's get it done and let's get home. This is particularly true, Charles, of those uh, reservists and National Guard people who were called up. And there's a, a double sacrifice, if you will, because not only they have to leave home and hearth, but they had to leave their jobs and businesses. The great hardships, uh, great sacrifices have been made out here, not just on the battlefield with valor and grit. There was a lot of that, but particularly with those uh, reservists and National Guardsmen, uh, other sacrifices. And keeping in mind that when that scud hit in Saudi Arabia just uh, two days ago, uh, that the 28 Americans killed and the more than 100 injured, nearly all of them uh, were reservists. Let's go down to Eric Ingberg in Dharan, Saudi Arabia, from here in Kuwait City. Eric? We're with uh, Mitch Mitchell, who is a CBS News consultant on military matters, retired Army colonel, uh, that sounded tonight like the president was certain that the war is near over. What's your understanding of the military situation right now? Eric, there are probably no forces left to defeat in southern Iraq or Kuwait. And so our forces have about two and a half hours to finish up operations, pull back into nice, tight, consolidated positions, and await the Iraqis' move, if they make any. It's hoped that this will hold the line right here and that nothing else will happen. What, what about the threat that seemed implicit in what the president said to resume military operations? If the Iraqis strike us, our allies or anyone else with offensive action will resume hostilities against them and I can expect that that will be very devastating. It will be with great violence to give them the message clearly this time. Dan? <laughs> right. I got a different way. Okay. Well, we're smiling a little bit here as we got uh, some late word that uh, the Marines are celebrating tonight, as you would expect, and so are the Egyptians, the Saudis, everybody else involved in, in freeing Kuwait go. City. When we drove into I, Kuwait City I this afternoon it was a by a convoy, uh, this was a convoy of journalists uh, brought in to have a look uh, at the city, and the convoy was absolutely besieged by joyful uh, Kuwaiti citizens who came out of their houses they shot off uh, AK-47s and other weapons that they'd hidden in their houses. Uh, they hadn't seen many American troops. The plan here was to keep uh, the American troops sort of uh, low profile, let the Arab troops be seen high profile. And because um, among the first Americans they saw were journalists, uh, they said to us, thank you. Not that we deserved it. The fighting young men and women, of course, deserved it. but because we happen to be Americans, they said, you know, thank you, thank you very much. Now, it's an eerie time here in Kuwait City. This place is, is it's, it's absolutely wrecked. It's been savaged. And tonight, 
all those people who are celebrating around our little caravan in here today are now back in their homes. There's no electricity, there's very little running water, the sewage is, uh, is a problem. The oil wells, we can see them burning off in the distance and the great cloud of smoke hangs over here. The gulf is almost you know, polluted with uh, oil everywhere. It's going to take years to clean that up. Uh, and there's a, a sense of danger still because there are mines and some booby traps and there are reminders of everywhere what a war zone this is. Just a few feet beyond our camera, let me show you what's over there. Now this had been something called Shrimpy's Restaurant by the Sea. The water's right out there with a long blonde beach. Shrimpy's Restaurant by the Sea became in effect a bunker for Iraqi troops with their SAM missiles. They had their anti-aircraft batteries up here. This is from where they would fire the SAM missiles at the telephone communications. Right up here on this rooftop looking right out toward the sea over here. This is their bunker in here. I want to be a little careful to make sure now this is wired booby trap work. These are their launchers, the SAM missile launchers. Look, one, two, three, four, five, six boxes. Careful, Chris. Filled the SAM missile. Box after box. Doesn't take much imagination to see the Iraqis in here. They're looking, looking day and night out to the sea, out this way, up to the sky. They'd be using their SAM missile launchers to knock down the planes, using their machine gun and other weapons nests up on this roof to spray Marines that they were obviously convinced were going to come charging in on those beaches. And this is right on the beach, a command bunker. Holes to fire out of here. Clips of 7.62 ammunition, Soviet-made fragmentation grenade. This one's secure, the pins out of it. Concussion grenade. Come on in here. A lot of this stuff is marked Jordan. Clip after clip, fast feeding. Careful where we put that down. The intention was to make what's out front of this command bunker a killing ground for Marines. Everywhere along this beach, small trenches, foxholes, deep, long, interconnected trenches, and up here, an anti-aircraft gun emplacement. And in the sandbag emplacement, your standard anti-aircraft artillery, AAA, dug in deep pointed toward the sea and skyward. They had a lot of these in here. All around the edges, sound bags and these rounds. Some of them were green, tracers or flares. Lots of ammunition stacked up here. Some of it spent. They'd fired this gun a couple of times at least. A couple of times they fired it. Not very well maintained equipment. It is, in fact, an appalling condition. And a lot of the Iraqi equipment we see, not only is it old, looks like something maybe left over from World War I, but it's atrociously maintained and not very well cleaned. And a little hole for the gunner, so when he took incoming, he could hide and survive. Sandbags, bricks, wood, then dug in deep into the sand. This whole beach right out in front of me, catacombed with that kind of thing, it'll take a long time to make sure it's safe from mines and booby traps. A couple of points. Marine General Walter Boomer, General Mike Myatt, whom we spoke to here uh, earlier, as was the case with General Norman Schwarzkopf earlier in the day, two big feints worked, made the war shorter. One feint was the feint of a Marine amphibious landing. The Iraqis clearly were expecting that, and it was a diversionary action all along. The other was a feint toward the middle, right up the gut, uh, of the thickest Kuwaiti defenses put by the Iraqis west of here. General Schwarzkopf with uh, General Colin Powell designed a feint up in there to make Saddam Hussein believe that the Allied attack was going to come right into those trenches. And 
in effect, the Iraqis bought it and opened themselves to the great sweeping flanking movement, uh, including uh, vertical envelopment with airborne forces such as the 101st Airborne in southern Iraq. So the two feints made it work, along with the valor and grit of the fighting men and women on the ground, Charles. Dan, we can be grateful, can't we, that the Iraqis chose to pull out of Kuwait City. That bunker you just showed us and the other fortifications there make it clear that if the Marines had been forced to fight door to door uh, for control of Kuwait City, that might have been a rough fight. It would have been a rough fight, Charles, and the casualties would have been high. General Mike Myatt, the uh, Marine uh, general who liberated this city, in effect, said that he's awfully glad that he didn't have to fight on the beaches. He did say that some Iraqi units fought with great determination and valor, but he found that if, and this is the way he put it, if we hit them real hard right in the beginning, then they'd back away. He also uh, used Andrew Jackson's uh, old technique of flank, flank, and keep flanking, and once they started running, poured on them. Dan Rather, to whom we will return, that... Uh battle he was talking about for Kuwait City will not have to be fought uh, now. No more battles will have to be fought unless the Iraqis start them because the President of the United States announced 15 minutes ago that at midnight tonight, Eastern Time, the Allied forces will suspend all their offensive combat operations. So the war's over unless the uh, Iraqis resume the shooting. This, said the President, is a victory for all mankind. It took six weeks of bombing, four days of furious land war, and apparently it's over. General George Christ and General Michael Dugan can help explain how this situation came to be, and they're going to do that now with Bob Schieffer. Bob? Good evening, Charles, and they certainly can. General Dugan, the retired Air Force Chief of Staff, General Christ, uh, who was General Schwarzkopf's predecessor in that uh, theater of operations, General Christ, earlier today, General Schwarzkopf gave us this remarkable briefing about how well the battle had gone, but he noted at the time that there was still a battle going on. Now, how is it, what has happened since he talked today that allows the president to say tonight that we can cease military operations uh, in a matter of hours? Bob, since that time, the great army of Saddam Hussein has been reduced to a little pocket around Basra and a few remaining units wandering around the middle of Kuwait. That's all that's left of that 540,000 man army. It's not clear to me, we talked, uh, Charles mentioned a bit earlier, it would have been a very nasty situation had we been forced to fight in Kuwait City. Uh, do have, ha have U.S. forces taken that city of Basra? Wh what is the situation there? As far as I know, no. They have defeated the Republican Guard divisions, which were located along here, and have now pushed them up against the Euphrates. They have pulled in toward Basra where they're pretty much holed up right now. Not much left of them, just sort of sitting in there. It's been said so much today that it's almost a cliche, but indeed it was a brilliant strategy that the Allied commanders uh, followed in this. Uh, show us on the map, General, just exactly what happened and how this war came to the end that it did. Bob, not only was it brilliant, but it was very, very bold. He first started out by arraigning his forces south of Kuwait to make Saddam think that we were coming straight up the line as he expected us to do. Then he put in air attacks all along these front lines to weaken them along with the Republican guards. Having put all that in place, then he swung in an amphibious force to make Saddam think that this is where we were going to come. Ha ha, but that's not what he did. In fact, while this was going on, he carefully swung a force way out to the west of which Saddam was absolutely unaware. So he was still looking for the amphibious feint. The next thing he did was crack off the Marines and the Arab forces to hold these people here, except the Marines were much more successful, I think, even than Norm Schwarzkopf thought they were gonna be because they got all the way to Kuwait. Then he came across, made a hole, and took the British and passed them through and literally swept in on the flank of the forces in Kuwait, sweeping up all the Iraqi forces behind it. While that was going on, and the Iraqis were trying to figure out what was happening here, he cracked off a great armored force, three armored divisions heading up to the north. Meanwhile, the French had swung out way to the west 
and cut all the routes coming out of Basra this way. As these people began to turn in toward the Republican Guard, making contact, the 24th Division and the 101st went out and cut the block. That was it, no way out of Basra. And then finally the armored forces went in on them and took out the Republican Guard, left them then with his little force here and this little force here. Thousands of troops, thousands of tanks being moved rapidly on that battlefield, air being shifted. Within days, an airborne division is moved from one end to the other, and he ends up with this. I doubt that the Iraqis had the foggiest idea, Bob, what was going on. And he was very careful, General Schwarzkopf pointed out today, he did not move those forces to the west until he had knocked out the Iraqi Air Force. He said, we knocked out their eyes, and then we moved the troops. Uh, General Dugan, uh, quickly, uh, did, he said early on that he thought that, uh, th that the, the army had collapsed two weeks ago. Even the Pentagon backed away from that. What did he know that the Pentagon didn't know or didn't want to say at that time? Well, first of all, he has the feel that a commander on scene has as he looks at his troops, as he looks at the, the morale and the pre preparation of his troops. Uh, he has a much better feel for the uh, disposition of the enemy forces than one has back in, uh, in, uh, in Washington. And uh, he just had a sensing. Uh, he had that feel that commanders, we pay commanders to have. The man on the, man on the, the scene. The man on the scene that knows that this is a, a risk worth taking and we're ready. All right, back to you, Charles. Speaker Tom Foley uh, was one of those uh, eloquent uh, men in the uh, Senate, uh, in the House, and uh, there were some in the Senate who opposed this war from the beginning. Let's uh, turn to Speaker Foley, uh, who listened to the president along with all the rest of us, and and ask him uh, what he was thinking as the president was speaking. Mr. Speaker? Well, I think it's important to note that from the beginning there was a support in the Congress, including the support that I and others gave for sending our forces to the Gulf region and confronting Saddam Hussein and defending Saudi Arabia and demanding the support for the UN resolutions. The resolution that was voted on was to whether to go into an offensive military operation. And that vote was taken by the Congress. I think it was a vote that should have been taken. This war will never be accused of being a war that was carried on without authority, without constitutional mandate. The majority in Congress voted to give the president the authority, and he has taken that authority and, I think, conducted this operation brilliantly. And uh, we can all be deeply grateful that the casualties have been so low and the victory has come so fast. After the vote was taken in the House and the Senate, uh, all parties and all members uh, overwhelmingly voted to support the President as Commander-in-Chief and to support the troops in the field. And tonight I think we can give a, a special echo to the President's assertion that we owe a great debt of gratitude to our men and women and to the military leadership that has performed so brilliantly. It seems to be over, Mr. Speaker, but as we know, it's not really over. Uh, what next? Uh, what next on the diplomatic front in that region? What's the most important thing, do you think? Well, the UN resolutions call for the coalition uh, seeking to bring not only the restoration of the legitimate government of Kuwait and the expulsion of Iraqi forces from Kuwait, but peace and security to the region. And I think that is going to be a much larger and longer task Obviously, uh, we are going to be concerned about uh, whether uh, Saddam Hussein and the Iraqi authorities comply with the UN resolutions, whether they cease all offensive operations, whether they accept responsibility for the ruin that they brought on their country and the destruction they brought on the region. Beyond that, of course, is the question of what can be done to limit the future risks uh, to security of the area, including the importation of arms and the development of some hopeful uh, resolutions of long-standing problems. And in all those efforts, I think it's important that the coalition and the United Nations continue to have a major cooperative role in bringing about those elements of peace and security that are part of the ultimate uh, objective here. Thomas Foley, Speaker of the House. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The President announced that Allied forces will suspend offensive combat operations two and a half hours from now at midnight Eastern Time. That concludes our uh, special CBS News coverage for the moment. However, we will uh, be back with uh, news updates. 48 hours will be on the air later tonight. More coverage of the war and the President's speech on your late local news. 
then a special hour-long edition of America Tonight, a national town meeting. Uh, we solicit your questions about what the president said tonight and about what the United States ought to do next. With correspondence uh, here in the States and in the Gulf, Leslie Stahl and I will uh, conduct that after your late local news. Until America Tonight, then, for CBS News, I'm Charles Carroll. Thank you.